Our next speaker has over 15 years of experience in quality assurance, primarily in arts and entertainment ticketing uh, field. He is a graduate from University of Connecticut. He comes from Hartford, New England. Please welcome onto the stage Jeff King. Thank you. So I get to follow up uh, someone who spoke all over the world with my first presentation internationally, so be kind. Um, how many people here work in an automation group of five or less automation engineers? Raise your hand. Okay, do we have anyone that's in a group of three or less? Do we have any solo artists like me? Okay, pay attention. Um, yeah, so this is uh, Robot Framework and the One Man Band. Um, I'm going to talk a bit about how the automation engineer uh, does the QA work, the manual or the automated testing, but how we also do some other things. I'm going to talk a little bit why Robot Framework was the ideal tool for a small IT group, and how to become uh, a rock star or a team player at your organization. So this here is how automation is viewed by different segments of a company. Uh, we kind of see ourselves like these, like, can do anything, rock star. I'm a big Brian May fan, so we got Brian May there. Management, they might not quite get what we're doing or how we do it, but they like the results. Um, if you ever try to talk to any of the non-IT folks about what you do, they, they kind of think we have these contraptions and machines, and they're not 100% certain how we, we do it, but they like the results as well. Um, sometimes we run across project management or, or planners and they don't really know how to account for our time or, or, how, or what we do. Um, so it's a bit of a stop on projects, but in the long run they're happy that we do this. Uh, de developers see us sort of as these um, hybrids or these mutants of what they do. We use different tools than they do sometimes, but we do kill the bugs, which they like. But what I think we really are is uh, sort of like the Swiss Army knife. We're, we're a tool that can do many different things. And as we go forward, and we can do a lot more than just testing. So this is a little bit about my background. Um, as we said, uh, I'm doing, I've done 15 plus years of um, quality assurance. When I started, it was all, almost all manual. There was one little piece that a developer wrote. It was a proprietary automation system. Um, that was at the NASDAQ, NASDAQ stock market, which was like a, a ratio of 80 developers to like 50 QA, because quality was so important there. We did a lot of manual testing, uh, just Word docs with tests in them, or test link, or whatever the, the tool was at the time. Then I moved into the event ticketing industry. Um, again, more, I'd say about 90% manual testing over time, a little bit more automation. Um, we used automation a lot with a, a tool we had to sort of keystroke record what our offshore teams were doing. We had a, a product that could be executed in four or five different ways. So that sort of showed us where the bugs were coming from when they did their testing or let us know what they covered. In 2014, I moved to Audience View, which was another company in the event ticketing industry. Uh, side note, they just changed their logo today, so I'm glad I did not put that logo on my slides. Um, here I started learning a lot more about Robot Framework. Our quality manager had implemented a Robot Framework test suite before I arrived and sort of handed it off to me to work on. Um, we, we had a, a small test set, but we kept adding to the test set. They did use the DevOps and Scrum model, so there were different sectors that had their own automation, but they were all in Robot Framework at the time. Um, as that went on, I started doing more and more automation, and, and some things to think about that Robot Framework was used, we tested the uh, Harry Potter play in London using Robot Framework, if anyone got to see that. We tested um, a special project for Wembley Stadium in London as well, and uh, the Grand Old Opry in Tennessee in the United States. All, that, all those softwares used uh, the automation tools from Robot Framework, which is kind of neat to, to think about. But uh, at, 20, at the end of my time at Audience View, I had been working remotely for 10 years, and it was time for me to get back into an office and be sane again. So I decided to take a, a, a leap into a new industry, the travel insurance industry at Travel Insured International, where I was hired as an automation engineer. Uh, most of my time now is spent working on automation. Uh, when I came in, there was no automation tools, so I had to go through and select some of the tools. 
So again, Travel Insured has uh, been around for about 25 years. It's a small IT group. Uh, they're owned by Crum and Forrester, but they sort of let us have our autonomy as far as what we choose. When I was brought in, I had to help develop the QA process, but I also had to choose an automation uh, strategy. And the big deal was when I came in, they were also completely redoing their, their customer-facing website. So there was no time for me to do any training. I had to pick something that would work right away if I wanted to contribute. So I had to build automation from scratch. Like I said, there was no other automation tools there. Um, what I did was I just sort of went through and looked at different automation tools. Knowing that I knew Robot Framework, I assumed, uh, I gave it the benefit of the doubt, but I did try some other things. And as time went on, um, I decided to choose Robot Framework. The reason I chose Robot Framework was it was simple and versatile. I didn't have any other um, engineers on the QA side. We have really good business analysts, but they didn't have a background in automated testing. Um, so I figured that I could teach them because it is very trainable, learnable, and uh, we've had some success with that already. Um, and again, we, we were putting out builds uh, three or four times a day, and I needed to have an automated suite that would check those builds since there were different teams building into the same branch. So that was the great thing about that. Uh, so it was a success. We were able to launch the, the new website uh, within a, about a week of our a real deadline, which is pretty good. Uh, I was pretty happy with that. And from there, we sort of had to move on and say, OK, we've built these prototypes in a robot framework, but we need to have uh, some sustainable future tests for UI and API testing. That's primarily what we do. Um, so we had to do some cleanup on the scripts that were created for that rush to get that, that out. And we also had to bring automation to our team at Travel Insured. So being the only automation engineer, there's always the concern that you can be stranded by yourself within the company. And there's a bunch of ways that you can go about making sure that you don't become an island to yourself. Some of the things that I did was, uh, right away, uh, and this is something I brought over from a previous job, I was demoing the automation in the sprints. Now, it might seem kind of boring to just put, put a, a screen up and have it run through your UI tests or even API tests. But I found it was useful, not just for um, the development team to see what I did, but it was also good for the, from their feedback for me as well. Um, I also do learning and demos within the business analyst group, and not just the business analyst group, but non-IT people, where I've showed them some of the things that, that I've built. And I get some feedback from them as well. And uh, we're also starting to look into some process automation, which I'll have a sample of as we go forward in this presentation. And again, another big thing, and I know two years ago we had to talk about this, but the robot framework community, when you're a solo artist like me, it's great to go out to the Slack channel or to the forums or the emails and get some responses, because to me it feels like pretty much every problem I encountered, um, there was a solution for. Um, more technically, uh, another way to avoid being stranded or left by yourself is to put the logic into your keywords. Uh, for me, uh, it was easier, uh, the reports were cleaner when, when all that stuff that appears like coding and logic is away from the non-IT people and they could look at the built-in reports within Robot Framework. It's easier to write test cases as well. Um, and like I said, interpreting the results. And I'll have a, a sample here where I have written some keywords that make it easy for anyone to test a, a chatbot product that we released. So um, I sort of think of the future of automation not just as quality testing, but some other aspects. So I'd like to introduce you to the band. I apologize to any drummer who's seeing this because I do not play the drums. So the, the quality part, I sort of equate to the vocals. Um, this is sort of where we're heard, um, even though sometimes we don't really want to be heard because people just want to know that everything works in the background. But I think uh, the ability for our reports to be clean and to show people our results and have the, uh, the reports make sense um, is a huge deal on how we can show what we're doing. Um, I think it's also very important that um, we share these reports not just with our IT team, but to management above or other parts. If they uh, say a non-technical person is wondering why are we having all these problems in our production environment, we can say, well, here's a report that shows that we're doing these tests, so we're not leaving these things alone. Maybe you need to come back to us with some use cases that we're missing. 
So again, I was talking about the chatbot. Um, I put together a pretty simple automated suite to test the Salesforce integrated chatbot that we're using. Uh, the chatbot allows for button inputs and it allows for typing. Um, I wrote this with robot framework in mind that some non-engineering uh, type people would be writing these test cases. I have a sample here. So uh, this, this sample here just goes over two of the functions. There might be other functions within that I've stripped out. But basically, these, these two keywords here, one is going to verify your responses that come back uh, from the chatbot, and then one is going to show you how to click the buttons. Um, I'm using argument-based test cases, which when you're dealing with non-technical resources is a huge, uh, huge help. They can send in files. Um, all you have to really do is throw that keyword in front and they can sort of write the test cases on their own, which I had some non-technical people write test cases for uh, this, this particular uh, project we were on. As you can see for the menu, um, I'm using uh, an XPath locator that looks for the label name. Um, I think it's actually the text content field if anyone uses Salesforce chat integration. Um, you'll find that that, that that makes it so they don't have to think about how do I get it to push this button, all they have to do is put in the name of whatever's supposed to be on that button, and they can click it. Now, this is a very small test case sample, but it's also possible that you could have a whole dialogue from this. And I have other test cases that would verify three responses or one response or that verifies the hard-coded error message that you're supposed to get back. So I think of the analyst like the lead guitar. Um, it can sort of stand out at any part of the, the process or the song. Um, analysts sort of are the glue that put everything together in a release, in the release cycle, and even after the release. And again, the automated tools can be used at different times as well. So one of the things that I've been working on, uh, we have a, an error reporting tool on our server log in production. Uh, I can now take the output from that and stick it into a certain test case, uh, keyword uh, and create a test case from that to try to reproduce some of the issues that we might find on the production side since our data is not the same in both systems. We don't have a replicator. We have our own QA and development data sets. Um, this is a useful tool uh, because it takes a lot of the time out of trying to reproduce an issue when we just know exactly what's coming in. Um, and again, the cool thing about the automation as well is I can strip out um, the real traveler's name and email address for our particular stuff. Um, I can create fake credit card numbers and fake credit card transactions because our logs do not keep credit cards, obviously. Um, another tool that, that's pretty useful is the screenshotting. Now, um, a lot of times we use the screenshots in those reports to see what's wrong in our software, but it, it's really nice to be able to also present, especially on mobile devices, some screenshots for our training and, and documentation teams as well. Um, here we are with the, the data, which is the bass guitar. Um, it can play a lot of roles within the song at any time. It can be the melody, harmony, or rhythm in the song. And that's the same with data. Uh, and with data, when I choose to use automation to create my data, a lot of it comes down to, should I be using API or SQL? Um, some processes, there's already built-in SQL stuff. We have SQL engineers. We have people that can do that. Not a problem. But uh, sometimes that stuff does not exist in our native uh, toolkit, so we can use API and we can use API automation. Again, there's a lot of choices when it comes to using the API, uh, doing API automation with the different libraries. Um, and I'll let someone else speak about that. I happen to use HTTPS library, which I know is going away or being sort of moved to other things, but uh, I'll get to that. <laughs> um, our workflow that I needed to use uh, had two API um, posts. The first post comes back with a bunch of uh, results in a JSON string, and from there we can either do system-generated tests so that we could test one thing in one environment and move it to another, or just to create testing data. Um, we had uh, a release recently where we added a bunch of new configuration into uh, one of our pages, and we couldn't do it directly through SQL. Uh, the whole idea was that a user would set this up. Um, so I actually had to create thousands of transactions uh, in order for this to be tested by our QA team and also our 
product development, our product management team also needed to look at this as well because they were making changes on the fly. Um, and again, here's a, a sample looping purchase API. Uh, I've got one part here where I'm just getting my, my prices back and then I'm looking for one of the JSON values which will tell us um, how many um, price points have been returned. And then I run my loop for how many ever price points there are. Um, I'm calling another keyword that assembles the JSON string and creates the purchase uh, with my buy post. And this gives me a bunch of data. Um, and I talked a little bit about how this can also be um, creating test cases, and I'm gonna show an example of that in a little bit. So process and DevOps automation is sort of like the drums. Um, it just keeps going and going. The song goes with it as it continues on. Um, our DevOps process is pretty straightforward and simple where I am now. At my previous job, we had Jenkins integration, which we don't need to do now. Because our uh, builds and deploys are on a time schedule, we actually just use window task, Windows Task Scheduler uh, to run our, our, our um, automation cycles. Uh, that's been fine, or we manually can start them. I've created a bunch of batch files and stuck them onto our automation box so non-technical um, resources can just start the batch file and get the results. They know where to find the log files. Um, so a little bit about process automation. People sometimes are afraid the robots are gonna take over. There's a lot of reasons why people are afraid of, of automation when it comes to process automation. I found that's actually uh, a bigger, the fear of it is actually bigger than the actual creation of the RPA. But it, it, for me, it comes down to this. And I, I'm sorry if I offend any football fans by that particular goal that's going in. But uh, humans make mistakes, and robots make mistakes when humans make the robots wrong. So the best way to start process automation is to start simple. Um, you have to think of the tasks that are the most mundane, that you have perhaps um, specialists within your company working on that they don't really need to work on. They, they, if they could be automated, the specialists could be doing their specialized jobs. Uh, and the thing I always come up with is, would you like your management team stuffing envelopes all day, or would you rather have a machine do that? Um, there's tasks that are on the UI that, that are like stuffing an envelope. Um, and what I've done in my sample here uh, is really just take an automated test, strip out some of the, 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 the validations, and, and make it into um, a process automation. So this is a pretty, uh, sample, a pretty simple sample. Um, we were using, uh, uh, in, our parent company provided us a third-party service to help with some of our um, uh, ser customer service, and we needed to create a huge batch of users. And this is a thing that we might have to do this batch uh, a few times in the future. Um, there, I've, I've simplified my sample, which I'll be showing in a second. Uh, but um, there are maybe eight to 10 fields, I think, that had to be filled in. And it would take a while for the UI to load. And there was even a, pro a part of the process that, for security reasons, where uh, an email was generated. And in order for the account to actually be used, um, someone would have to actually log in with the email associated to it. So that part we didn't automate for, for security reasons. So this one again is very simplified. It's another argument-based test case. Uh, what we could do here is, we, I've only got three fields on here, but uh, in the real, in the real um, world we had a bunch of fields like emails, first names, uh, contact info, that sort of thing. Um, I had uh, sort of a, a keyword layering approach where I did a lot of the, the logging into this new system through a set of keywords. Um, I provided an administrator one here. Um, I've stripped out, though, some of the tests that would make sure that a given user has certain accesses because we're assuming in the process automation that we're always using the administrator. And um, I also have stripped out some of the validations on the page that the page loads correctly. Um, I'm just making sure that I have that submit button. Um, I go in and I uh, put in the fields with the input text, input password. Obviously, with the real, in the real life, I would have many more fields that needed to be filled out in order to create the user. Um, then I su submit. 
Um, I've also stripped out a little bit of my validation uh, where I would go to the page where I could look for users and search that if I search by the username that I get back one and only one record. If it were to fail, we could write out um, an execution. Uh, we would fail the test so that when we fail the test, the people would know that the process automation had stopped. Someone would have to go in and look at the records. Um, and one of the ways I, I wrote this so that people could see what is being added as I'm using the system library and I have some file I'm going to throw in to this file which was provided in the argument up top, uh, the username and maybe some other information, I just stripped it out, and the execution status on the test. Um, this way we would know how long it took to create all the users, so if people like metrics and they like to see how long this process automation is saving in time, we, we know how long it takes the user to manually enter this all and look it up, but this way we would have our, our, our execution time. Uh, and then uh, from there, uh, we, we can hand that off to whoever is in charge of, of reviewing that the process automation has worked correctly. So uh, in summary, uh, the reason that we were successful in launching and integrating uh, into a robot framework uh, really had to do with the, the choice of that as the automation tool. So we were, we were able to add automation. Uh, you know, right now it's, it's quality and we're moving towards the process automation and we're gonna keep using robot framework and the tools that are there. Uh, again, I don't come from a, a, a strong technical background like many people, but I'm able to find everything I need within the libraries that exist. I'm using one JavaScript call right now to handle some um, security tokens, but everything else is just right out of the box. Um, and that's, that's great when it comes to having other people in your team, maybe your analysts coming in and starting to, to develop their own automation within the tool set you have. Um, it, the automation tools have been great for us for creating data, which we use for demos, we do for reporting, we use it for, um, we create automated tests that create uh, manual data for manual testers. Um, and the great thing as we go forward is this automation uh, has really allowed our company to use the resources in the best way possible. Um, in the past, uh, because there was no automated tools, it was sort of an all hands on deck and the, the builds and releases would be much less frequent because you knew you were gonna lose some of your um, most important people's time. Uh, now that we have this automated suite, you can imagine if they didn't have anything like this uh, before, they get this report every day that says, well, it looks like most things are working. Um, can you look at this one thing that didn't work? Um, we have pretty good confidence that this build works and we can move it up to our, our higher environments. Uh, that is not me, I'm not that skilled, but um, just continue on, I guess, uh, and rock on to all the automators. Uh, we have time for uh, a couple questions. Are there any questions? Oh, someone's got to throw the thing. I, I don't have a good throwing skill. Hello. Hello, check. Oh. Yeah, I was just curious. Um, with all your work in the automation that you've done, um, do you, does your team find time to do exploratory testing? Is that uh, something you do? That's, that's huge. That's actually sort of where we're going. So our analysts are doing a lot of that exploratory testing right now. Again, um, I came from a different industry, uh, and the two business analysts in, my, in our quality team have, uh, I think, like 15 plus years travel insurance uh, expertise, so they can do that kind of stuff that just wouldn't occur to me. I'm still thinking in concert tickets and how to break the recaptcha so I can get onto the sites and then make sure that nobody else can do that. Um, that's a good point, though. That it does, that's one of those things where I talk about people who are doing their jobs, uh, doing the more specialization of their jobs, are able to do more special things. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. Someone's got to go like way back there. I want to see him try to throw it way back. <laughs> I want to see if his throwing arm's good. As a one-man band, you mentioned that the uh, Slack groups and, and discussion groups in general and all the ready-made libraries are great help for you. Uh, are there other things besides those that you really wish would exist or would be improved or somehow made better regarding Robot Framework as a one-man band? Uh, yeah, and it's very specialized to the particular um, place where I am right now. I wish we had some more libraries that could work with imaging and scanning. So we get a lot of um, claim stuff that comes in in the insurance industry and a lot of it's 
a lot of that, we're, we have a trend where we want to automate everything. So we also have developers writing um, stuff to read scans and to get the files in faster so we can pair claims out faster. Um, but if we had something like that, again, very specialized, but it would be useful. I think that's all we have time for Jeff. Uh, huge applause for Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. It was awesome.